Hello, welcome to the Donahue Group. Glad you could join us for this uh, interesting half hour of conversation. We are delighted to welcome back into our midst our dear Republican friend who's sort of dressed all in purple today, uh -huh. which I think is a nice sign of a moderating influence, Tom Paneski. He's gone bipartisan. He's gone bipartisan. <laughs> the spirit of the... Rush Limbaugh is going to hear about this, right? Um, but uh, Tom is here, Cal Potter, formerly of the State Senate. Ken Risto, formerly of the uh, central uh, part of the uh, Sheboygan Area School District, now a humble school teacher. I'm Mary Lynn Donahue, a lawyer with Hop Newman Humkey. We've got a lot to talk about today. It's really pretty exciting. And Tom, just, I just want you to know I'm like really sorry. <laughs> Put a smile on her face. I had my smiles a few years ago. There you go. You got yours now. Okay, well, we, we, just we, we, we were talking in our last uh, segment about how nice election nights that you win are, but you know, soon enough the, uh, the worm turns and uh, life isn't quite so good. It just has a tendency to do that, but in any event. So. Yeah, people now start to ask questions. Wisconsin, though, was very uh, interesting in the election. First of all, it was blue, blue, blue. Obama won 56% to McCain's 46%, I think. Sheboygan County went McCain. Well, it did. Yes, it did. Yes, we, it did. We, we, we talked to Sheboygan County. Yeah, but barely by That's 400 true. votes. And if you take the 382 votes that Nader got in Sheboygan County and put them in Obama's column, it could have been. But in any event. Uh, nonetheless, uh, there were some, some interesting, I think, 56 out of 72 counties went for Obama. Um, that's about Russ Feingold's uh, percentage uh, in his last election, and I think he's become you know, pretty popular. Um, Wisconsin had the second highest percentage turnout in the nation, and it was even down a little bit from 2004. So what do you think? Are we turning into... Um, a, a great Obama nation here in, Shibu uh, in, uh, in Wisconsin? Uh, was it the, the candidate? What, what do you think? Sarah Palin. <laughs> really, I think... I think <laughs> in two words, all right. Yeah, Sarah Palin. Sarah Palin. Go for it. I, I, no, I really think that as I talk to a good number of friends of mine, these are all anecdotal, I didn't take any polls, <laughs> I can't speak for whether, but I talked to a lot of friends of mine, not, in, not including my good friend here to my right, uh, metaphorically and politically. Yeah. Um, but um, they said they, they just, um, they love John McCain, but they just couldn't see that woman being a heartbeat away from the presidency. And uh, they were people who were, they were people who really believed uh, in, in fiscal restraint. There were people that, you know, the old tried true Republican uh, values, but um, they just, uh, just couldn't stomach her. I concur. I mean, I'm sure I she did well in Waukesha County, but I think there were a lot of people in Wisconsin who are consider themselves moderate Republicans who just couldn't uh, accept the style of campaigning and the fact that they didn't think she's ready. I mean, I was surprised. I, I know a few of my family members who I think are fairly, who are, well, a family member who's a, I, my son who's an entrepreneur and a Republican in a sense, he's, uh -huh. he's and he just couldn't stomach uh, Sarah Palin and I couldn't believe he voted the way he did. It was a close but he's in Colorado. His mother again. <laughs> he's in Colorado. He's in he's in Colorado. But I mean, and then I've talked to others, and they just said the same thing. I can't, you know, Sarah Palin, Sarah, just like you said. Yep. So, and it was also the right time for Obama. It was. Uh, oh uh, yeah. It was just the right time, I think. Yeah. Well, so. the economy went to heck, and Wisconsin was yeah. not yeah. spared from that. I mean. So the Janesville plant and the other closings, I think, just yep. added to the uh, image that most 62% of the people said this was the economy. So I think Wisconsin shared in that. Yeah, sure. yeah. It yeah. was and it was a perfect storm, I think, for perfect the Democrats. Perfect storm. Democrats, you know, did a good job of McCain and Bush couldn't separate, two, and the people were anxious to get rid of Bush, and and vote for a young face, and mm -hmm. Obama was the young face. Yeah. I had a, a good number of people um, tell me that after watching the concession speech, if they had seen that John McCain uh, during the campaign, mm -hmm. they would have really thought long and hard about whether they would have voted for Obama. That speech was, uh, I assume, written by Stalter, um, yeah. or Salter, one of his names, Stalter, Salter, uh, who is sort of the 
uh, been with McCain for quite some time, helped write his books, and uh, was always pushing uh, that the narrative of John McCain as being the maverick and the one who stood for this, but that just ne he never won that argument during the during the campaign, and so I think there were people that you know they kept talking about you know who's who's Barack Obama? Well, who is John McCain? Mm -hmm. You know, John McCain actually had a reasonably intelligent immigration policy, which he moved away from. He was against the Bush tax cuts. He moved away from that. I mean, there were people who just simply said, where is this, where is this and all And then of it? Sarah Palin gave yeah, him an exactly. Well, who's John McCain picking Sarah Palin? Yeah. It was a lovely concession speech. It's been a season of good concession speeches. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. I think Hillary Clinton's concession speech was absolutely the best speech of her career. And she's had some good ones, so in my mm. mind, at least, it was pretty high. I thought McCain was, it was wonderful. Ken and I have been, we're West Wing fans, to put it mildly, and the seventh season of West Wing was scarily close to this particular election. And I remember we said, oh, a scenario like that would never play out. Mm. The Republicans would never n nominate somebody moderate. And, you know, the, and I think Obama is, uh, you know, is hardly left wing, uh, in spite of all the ads and so forth. And you know, the Matt Santos, the Democratic candidate, had a, a you know, a, a good wife and two children, and the issues, and and on and on and on. But it was really, you know, pretty remarkable. And and I remember in Santos's. <laughs> We're reliving this in his um, speech as he was, uh, uh, you know, getting the accepting, not accepting the nomination, but acknowledging his win, you know, talked about what a great guy his opponent was. And it was very gracious. And I think that McCain did that in spades. And I think you're right that a lot of people yeah. who, I mean, we talk about people being put off by negative ads, but all the research seems to indicate that that's a pretty important decision maker for people as, as they're, you know, making, deciding who they're going to vote for, so. But I think the concern over the economy finally swamped all the, the negative mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And I, th yep. I think really it was just a lot of background noise. And I talked to a lot of people, and they weren't Democrats, uh, who really found, I don't know if, if everybody, all of you did, but I almost literally every day I've got a, a chunk of something from, uh, the, not the McCain campaign per se, maybe the Republican National Committee or whatever, uh, but, you know, flyers and things, and it was Jeremiah Johnson, and it was, you know, um, you know the Weatherman Ayers. connection, errors, yeah, and yeah. it was just a steady stream of that yeah. stuff coming in the house, and a lot of people really were turned off by it. Yeah. Um, and well, that was, that was all the Republican Party of Wisconsin. That could Those be. all came from... As this, being paid for. As paid for by yeah. The, yeah. the state party. Yeah. I was really surprised. I mean, they were vicious. There were a couple yeah. there that were, you know, really yeah. ugly. Yeah. And um, but we also saw the uh, the internet campaign this year, which was uh, a new mode of campaigning. Yep. So I think that's going to continue in the future, and uh, uh, it'll be interesting campaigns in the uh, as we we move I mean, when into you saw the future. The, yeah, when you saw Bi you know Biden's was announced first through the internet, yeah. you know yeah. through yeah. you know through cell phone announcements, text messaging. Yeah. And you're going to see a lot more of that. I think Bob, you know, Obama really wrote, it started writing a new chapter of campaigning that's going to be yeah. imitated by lots of folks now in the years to come. Although when you think about it, um, although Obama's electoral college percentage or margin was overwhelming, the popular vote was closer than I thought it was going to be. Uh, and uh, I mean, it was, there was no question that he won the popular vote as opposed to 2000. Um, but the amount of money that Obama spent compared to what McCain spent Oof. in Indiana and Florida. And I mean, the Florida, as I, I just saw this on, uh, you know, on TV, McCain, or, um, Obama spent over $11 million. McCain spent over $3 million. Well, Obama won, but just by a little. And he had real grassroots organizers out there, uh, you know, t you know he had a volunteer cadre of people, but just tons of money. And so if, what would have happened if the money had been more evenly balanced? So I knew that Clinton was going to lose way back when, when I saw the difference in money being raised. I mean, Obama, the money was just showering in, and Clinton was struggling. And I think with small donations like that, it indicates people were enthusiastic about mm -hmm. Obama. Yes. But, but he was lucky to have that much money because you wonder what would have happened uh, had that not been the case. 
Oh, what's going on in the state? Well, I was going on. to say, yeah. circling back to the state, state. and <laughs> and poor Tom. We yeah, we lost <laughs> the assembly too. So okay, well, we got a democratic state. Let's move on to something else. <laughs> Well, what do you think? It, uh, you know, the the um, I have had some Republican friends come up to me in Chortle and say, "Ha ha ha ha!" Well, what are you going to do in the legislature now? And I think the state of Wisconsin is in dire straits. Uh, things are looking grim. And do you want to be the full, the, completely in charge when things are that bad? Well, you don't want to be because you can't do anything proactive. But you want to be also because you control where the damage is going to go. Um, you know, Republicans would say, well, we've, we're going to downsize government and we'll take a meat axe to the university or DNR or, or whatever to make it, to, to balance it. And Democrats, I think, will start looking at certain things you know, with greater um, vision and saying we're going to downsize this because it's not as important as something else and they may say well we got to keep investment in education mm -hmm. or we've got to do this or that so I, th I think uh, you take your lumps uh, but you uh, you like to be in power because you can uh, control where the damage is going to be and there's no doubt that there have to be you know cuts it's just a matter of where they should go I wonder you know municipalities as opposed to education uh, really don't have not either under Republican or Democratic leaders come out very well in the past few years, and so the uh, the, the state revenues which come into municipalities have really been frozen, mm -hmm. and so it's an actual decline when you when you look at inflation right. and so forth. So it will be interesting to see to see how all of that plays out. We were talking off screen about whether or not um, Tom Barrett, who was an early Obama supporter, and certainly Jim Doyle was. Um, Without hesitation, and uh, whether or not they'll they'll be around, uh, if there'll be spots. Well, actually, no offense, but Barrett, you know, has the same executive experience as Sarah Palin, just in terms of size, because Milwaukee. And, sorry. Um, so I was Silla versus Milwaukee. <laughs> no, no, there's there as many people in Milwaukee as there are in the state of Alaska. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I was going to say I, mean, I thought you were going to be comparing mayors. Yeah. yeah, mayor yeah. to governor, and uh, yeah, there is some discussion in Washington. It'll be interesting to see what the Democrats do um, once they take the the Congress in January. The, there's talk that part of the next stimulus package may be direct aid to state governments to help make those cuts a little less painful. But I can't imagine that the national government is going to hand the state of Wisconsin what's the hole in the budget? Two billion? Two billion dollars? Um, no, I that's not going to happen. Yeah, no. Exactly. No, but there might be some some relief for infrastructure, roads, highways, that kind of thing, which, yeah. which is going to get. The, the, I know that's going to come out. Uh, it'll be interesting unless it's filibustered in the Senate. But, um, yeah. but yeah, we're planning at the Sheboygan Area School District. That we've been told pretty much flat out next year, probably about a five hundred to seven hundred thousand dollar cut, and mm -hmm. they're starting to plan on where we're going to cut and what we're going to do. Staffing is extremely tight at, at both north and south. I don't know what they're like in the elementary and middle schools, but we had to cut some classes that we normally would offer, and class sizes are bigger than we'd want them to be. And so things are going to start uh, really. Um, and Sheboygan, the district, is locked into a labor agreement till 2011. So those costs are pretty well fixed. So if they've got to cut, mm -hmm. it's going to be layoffs of staff at the bottom of the seniority list. Yeah. There's not too much room to maneuver as far as packaging there. They can reopen certain things, but not a whole lot. So, yeah, I think I think yeah. I think it's going to be tough, but it'll be interesting to see. Um, newspaper points out there's a uh, four-way, apparently a four-way race for uh, assembly speaker. Um, how, Cal? Just you were in the assembly before you before you went to the Senate. How important a position is that? Well, it's, it's the officer that everybody looks to to run the show. I mean, out of that office, uh, which has expanded staff, you come together with the uh, scheduling, what bills get scheduled and so on. So that, that person is not only the presiding officer over the body, they're presiding officer over the leadership committee. You know, there's a majority leader, an assistant majority leader. They meet weekly to establish what's going to be on the floor um, after things are kicked out of committee with a favorable vote. Uh, they don't have to schedule things. Uh, they can mm -hmm. let things set in what is known as the rules committee. 
Um, so it is a very, very important position, without a doubt. Yeah. And uh, so, so we have three from Milwaukee vying for the position, and then um, uh, uh, Mike Sheridan from Janesville, mm -hmm. who uh, I understand uh, is Doyle's candidate. Um, yeah. Usually, the outstate candidate does have the advantage simply because there's always that uh, feeling amongst some outstate legislators that Milwaukee is a, uh, already a big demander of funds for schools and shared revenue and so on. So, and it's used by sometimes by conservatives to say you know, they get more than their share and when actuality because they got the big population they don't get a lot more than their share but uh, that's an image thing. Sure. Um, just switching gears a little bit, I was surprised, and I'm thinking of uh, uh, John Gard was Assembly Speaker mm -hmm. uh, for a number of years and kind of ran it with an iron fist as, yes. as I had heard and read. Um, I was surprised that Kagan defeated uh, Gard as soundly as he did, and I don't remember what the percentage was, but it wasn't close. No, it was a fairly decent margin, yes. And yeah. um, I don't think, I, Steve Kagan from the Green Bay area, I. I, I I, I don't think he made any mistakes. Okay. I, I, I followed that race last time because I knew Guard, and um, Kagan, I think, held his own in, in, in this first two years in Congress. He didn't yeah. go off the you know, yeah, deep end with some, some type of uh, proposals, and I think his uh, looking at his ads were still focused on the bread and butter things. He talked about people's pain, you know, Social Security needs to be protected, uh, people need health care, you know. Mm -hmm. He talked about issues that I think people related to and they said, well, in the last two years he didn't screw up and he's talking about the issues that I relate to and here's John Gard really, because he was behind, was throwing some very mean ads at Kagan, but I don't think they stuck because the a. Kagan created an image that was uh, agreeable well, to most voters. And I think there was an Obama coattail. True. Yeah. I think it really helped. Yeah. Yeah. They have turnout high, yep. and they have that uh, Obama win is decisive. Because one of the districts that did go in the assembly, one of the three that did go to the Democrats, was the Lasse seat, and that yeah. that's part of Brown County down south into Manitowoc County. It's a rural district, but it did uh, put a Democrat in, into that assembly seat after many, many years of uh, having been under Frank Lasse. Well, and we, want, we wanted to just say a word of thanks to Frank Lasse and his years of service. Frank was an original. Yes, he was. <laughs> and, uh, I, I was on his, his, his list of emails every week. Uh, he did an electronic thing. And every newsletter was always filled with liberal, leftist, and I said, how can this guy repeatedly position himself way over here when I know suburban Green Bay and parts of Manitowoc County are not over on the right wing. They're in the middle, like most people are. And I think it did kind of catch up with him because uh, Ted Zygmunt, who was on the radio in Manitowoc County for many years and was, was known, um, did paint him in his ads and so on as, in outer space as extreme. And I think uh, that, that caught up with Frank Lasse. Well, my favorite position, because it brought national notoriety to, to this area, was, was uh, Frank Lasse's um, a proposition that uh, uh, teachers be allowed to have guns yeah, in the classroom, no, no, no. and uh, Stephen Colbert um, really focused on that in the in a you, Colbert you spend report. Any time in a faculty lounge, you realize what a foolish proposition that is. <laughs> <laughs> well, on all sorts I, of levels, those plastic sporks for the comes of the hot lunches. I don't uh -huh. even trust some of my colleagues. With those. <laughs> <laughs> really, you don't want yeah, you, you don't want. That. You don't so you want had anybody. sporks, uh, you know, in your back, and and yeah. yeah. No, you just don't want that. That was folks. that was a very very not yeah. thought out idea. Exactly. Well, and as Colbert said it, you know, yeah. he said. Face it, folks. This is chalk and awe, and um, so I thought it was. I thought it was pretty funny. Alberta Darling um, was the darling well, of the okay. Republicans, and yeah. I think Sheldon Wasserman was fairly gutsy for yes. for taking that on. And I think he was generally very well liked and energetic. And he would have had that assembly seat for many years. Exactly. But the Senate seat got into areas that were not uh, always friendly for Democrats. Exactly. So that's uh, that's interesting as well. One of the other interesting, we don't have a whole lot of time left, um, one of the interesting votes in Milwaukee was on the mandatory sick leave referendum, which is a binding referendum. 
placed on the ballot only because 40,000 people in the city of Milwaukee signed a petition to have it put on the ballot, requiring employers of various sizes to have, to have uh, paid sick leave. Now, there's, uh, depending on your size, the Wisconsin or State Family Medical Leave Act will generally provide for unpaid leave for a certain period of time. Um, and the uh, Chamber of Commerce in Milwaukee is, is indicating it's going to file suit. It passed really overwhelmingly, 68%. You could have knocked me over with a feather. Yeah. <laughs> I was stunned because I thought people would just really reject that out of, out of hand. But Well, I, I read the Chamber decided it was going to lose that. Uh, they put their money into the suit rather than put their mm -hmm. money into campaigning against it because mm -hmm. they figured uh, it was going to win. So mm -hmm. they thought, well, we're, we're going to garner our money, collect our money, and put it into a suit to see if we could defeat the... Uh, defeated. Yeah. What are the grounds of the suit? I don't know, but they're going to work on the suit. Uh, that's what I. That's what I read. Uh, well, typically, I mean, one of the one of the arguments that you would make is that this is not that something like this is not anything that a city has the authority to legislate. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, you argue that these are statewide issues, and the the legislature should do that. Whenever cities get into enacting ordinances that have really, really substantial impact. It, it, it gets a bit more tenuous. Well, there's another city, right? Uh, San Francisco has done it, and isn't there a third city that's done it? Well, there are some cities that have enacted living wage ordinances oh, living that, require, wage. that require contractors who do business with the city. Oh, but okay. that's the nexus, is that you're doing business with the city, and if you're, if you're doing that, you have to pay a minimum wage of whatever is determined. I mean, okay. the living wage now, if you don't have insurance, is 12 or $13 okay. an hour. That'll just get you just above poverty. Um, but that's not for the whole community. Okay. That's for employers who, who, who do business with the city. As I understand, the Milwaukee piece is that it's for the entire, entire, for the city. entire city. And would that employers could afford it, because I think it's critically important for, for particularly low-income workers who have tenuous arrangements for childcare. And when you have sick children and you have no place to go with a sick child because you can't take the child to the, to the daycare center or whatever, to have paid sick leave is, is, is a wonderful, wonderful benefit. Um, but can you legislate it? And I would say, I mean, we legislate minimum wage. We legislate yeah. no smoking in the workplace. Um, it would be so. interesting to see the spinoff. Uh, I mean, if I were an, uh, a young entrepreneur, I might want to start a business not in the city of Milwaukee, maybe on the suburbs of Milwaukee. And first, I don't know how the businesses yeah. are going to do in the city. They might decide, yeah, I was thinking about moving. This might just encourage me to make the move. The flip <laughs> side of it is, Tom, though, is that you would tend to have a more stable workforce because people who can take a little bit of paid time off, either because they're ill or because their kids are ill, tend to stay around. I'm, I mean, if, if you miss a couple of days of work, then you're fired you and they bring have in a job. somebody. The company's got, you gotta have a job to take a time off mm -hmm. and the company can't afford the, the job anymore. So they let you, lay you off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I don't know if it's a more stable workforce or not. Yeah. I and, might disagree with that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it'll be interesting to see to see how it plays out. But again, to get forty thousand people to sign petitions to get something on a ballot and then pass it by sixty-eight percent, that to me is uh, you know sort of an overwhelming uh, response to the. This is a critical need for for people to have to have this basic benefit, and it's low income benefits because most people who have decent regular jobs have paid sick leave. It's just you know the you know the folks that are really kind of at the bottom of the bottom of the pile. I think it, it, in a way it kind of shows that the, the motivation that people have to have benefits is being expressed through the ballot box and not through unionization. I mean, we're down well, to only about 12% yeah. in union membership. The Zenith was about, about 40%, I think, in 1965. So we've dropped tremendously in the area where unions used to negotiate those type of things for their employees. So I think there's a pent-up desire to have health care and sick leave and all these things, and people are not seeing, the union for whatever reason, maybe size of employers because we've had de industrialization in this country, yeah. but they're seeing the ballot box as a place where they're going to express themselves. So when you say they got 40,000 signatures, mm -hmm. I think you know you go back 
50 years, people expressed a lot of that through their union yep. negotiations. So today they're, they're signing petitions saying, yeah, I need this type of thing. I'm not going to get it because of the type of employment I have, so let's mandate it through the city or whatever mm -hmm. other avenue that they can find. Mm -hmm. Wasn't Mayor Barrett uh, opposed to the, uh, this legislation? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and I, I, and I mean, there is a financial cost, certainly. There's, you know, there's no doubt about that. But it'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, Attorney General Van Hollen is going to appeal his loss uh, in um, Judge Sumi's court, uh, I think in late October. Uh, he had, as you remember, filed suit with, to uh, force the Government Accountability Board to do these you know, fairly intense fact-checking, I guess I would call it, before the election. And uh, so it'll be interesting to see what, what course that takes as it, as it goes through an appeal. Um, I suppose, I mean, there's, there was not much talk of fraud in this particular no. election, mm -hmm. but part of that is because it was so, the, the, I mean, there were very few really, really close races. Uh, Jess King lost her Senate race to um, her opponent in the Oshkosh, uh, I think the 18th Senate District, close enough that I guess I, my understanding is there'll be a recount. Um, but generally, when you've got fairly wide margins, fraud is not really an issue. So, so it'll be uh, it'll be interesting to see to see how that plays out. How did, uh, the early voting, I think, was a, a plus because I guess I even saw lines, uh, people waiting for early voting, so you, the people didn't have the rush at the uh, at the voting polls on election day that they could handle it on a staggered basis so maybe yeah. the early voting uh, uh, helped out too yeah we were talking about that that it's uh, that none of us had a bad voting experience did you no. you're no. in the town of Sheboygan Falls right yeah walked right in no, no problem yeah I was in and out 10 minutes yeah. it was it was very interesting so um, just in our remaining time um, interesting um, you know the Milwaukee school district is really struggling 20,000 kids on vouchers 20,000 fewer in the district. The economic impact, I think, to the district is substantial? Yes. <laughs> it really, you know, it really, it, it really, yeah, it really, it really is. It really is. Milwaukee's school district is really in a crisis. MPS is really facing some very difficult times uh, because that's a, when you do the mathematics, the, the voucher program costs uh, the, the taxpayers of Milwaukee, the city of Milwaukee, a, a substantial amount of money. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's a, a city that can't, uh, I mean, already facing tremendous burdens. Maybe with a Democratic majority in both houses, we'll finally get some accountability on that program. Right. There's no reason why that money should be just gifted. To Time to wrap it up. Thank you for joining us.